We are live and recording. How you doing today, brother? How you feeling, man? I am great, man. How are you? Man, I'm doing well. Let me uh, begin by thanking you for taking time out of your tremendously busy schedule. Um, I know that uh, during this time, uh, we as pastors are more busy um, um, even than before. Uh, so we want, to, uh, <laughs> we want to thank you for doing that. And then I want to uh, do something that's really done among our uh, peer group, uh, which is say to you something publicly that uh, um, I've said to you privately. Um, um, praise God for your, your ministry, your leadership, um, not even during this pandemic, but before this. And just to say to you that um, just know you are a model and looked up to um, by so many, um, by how you have led a historical church. Those things can work one or two ways in those types of situations. And you certainly um, did it the right way and the positive way. And because of that, I believe God has tremendously uh, breathed on your ministry. You're one of our leading churches in the nation, uh, not the city, not the state, not the country, but the world. And um, just glad to know you and uh, respect that for you. And uh, outside of anything, I just want you to know that. Um, Appreciate we mean that, it clearly. <clears throat> um, uh, this is, uh, we're in a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, and um, I just want to begin uh, how I try to do with all our guests in light of this topic, is just ask you uh, very genuinely, how are you doing in light of this? Man, I'm, other than being extra busy and busier than normal, I'm pretty good, G. Um, that's it, man. And this is, uh, you, you and I talked before, and we've talked offline, mm -hmm. talked about strategies and thought processes. So you know me, and you know I'm, 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 I'm at home in this chaotic space because it gives me the chance to be as extremely out of the box mm -hmm. as I like to be. So right now, actually, man, I'm extremely comfortable in this time mm -hmm. because I can do stuff and uh, people can't shoot it down as much because they don't have other options. So I'm like, great. I'm loving it, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah are, for creative that, minds, that this really, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah for creative minds, this is really an advantage because yeah. you know it's like, and um, for those that um, operate with a sense of uh, leadership, not just integrity but knowledge, it's also an advantage because at this time, it's not really time for the group think, right? Uh, you have to you know, this is probably some of the frustrations with our president is not, you know, y'all do this and y'all do this. No, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're doing it. Here's why we're doing it. You just got to trust me. And if it go wrong, we just got to bat. It can't be different perspectives at this point. Right. By the time we figure out it's wrong, it's too late anyway. So, you know, let's just roll. Yeah. Let's just do it. Let's just do it and see. And, and most times God is so good. He honors our efforts anyway. How you doing, man? You know, thanks for asking. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, but I'm, I'm grateful. You know what I mean? Just staying busy helps it. And when I say I'm struggling, it's just the unknown. Um, yeah. Me personally, I can't complain. A good friend of mine I grew up with, spoke to him yesterday. He had been in a coma for 10 days back in Detroit. Wow. Um, lost 150 pounds. Guy looked like he's going to get him through this thing. Wow. So many people have lost their life. 26 million people filing for unemployment. Economy not in a recession nor depression, but on pause. Um, and just so, and so just, and I think it's just, for me, it's healthy to just admit it's tough. And, um, you know, talking to a mental health expert that we're looking in light of this to bring on to our staff, um, just have that strategically infused into the life of our church. Uh, you know, she's just very clear to us, like, no, don't try to, it's not a time to spiritualize this, and, right. you know, it's, this is rough, this is new, right. figuring it out, we're striving through it. Um, for me, a lot of my mental health was based off of travel experiences and things like that, uh, so now to be confined in a space, um, not by choice, but by, uh, by, by requirement, it's, it's an adjustment, it's an adjustment. Um, but, why I ask, bro, because I know how you are and traveling is your anti-drug getting out yeah. experience. So yeah, I understand that yeah. about it. that's exactly yeah. why I asked, man. 
I appreciate that, man. When was the first time you heard the word coronavirus? So when was the first time you heard it? And um, when, at, then at what point did you realize, oh man, this is major, this is serious? Well, the first time I heard it is when it, it, it broke out and was widespread in China. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't paid attention to Lysol cans or, you know, <laughs> none of that. And it's right. been on there for ages, you know, at least for a couple of years. I hadn't paid any attention to it. Uh, and I didn't pay a lot of attention until it broke out in China. And uh, so I think some Americans were on a ship or something over there. And that's when I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. And then yeah. when they stopped and traveling coming in from China, I, I listened a little more. But then when it started hitting home and people were being quarantined, and uh, that's when I really started to pay attention. And then it, man, it was like all of a sudden, it just, you know, and it probably was me not paying as close of attention as I could have or should have. But when it started hitting home and we start sheltering in place and shutting down and people were furloughing and laying off, I'm like, man, this thing is, it's the real deal. So that's when I really, really started paying attention. When did you realize that you had to make major adjustments as it relates to ministry in light of it? Uh... When, during March Gladness, man, my brother Keon was here and Donald were here and we were watching this. So if you know Donald Lawrence, he is, mm -hmm. you, you ever watched uh, that, that show Monk? I haven't. Well, he's like a germaphobe and he's OCD. Uh -huh. That okay. is Donald Lawrence. He is definitely a germaphobe. Okay. So uh, he, he would just say stuff and watching his posts and all that. And then, you know, Keon, I watched it while he was here. And so it happened while we were in March Gladness. We actually started knocking down the number of people we could have in public gatherings to mm -hmm. end that week off. And so at that moment is when it became real. And then Miles McPherson sent a text and was like, hey, man, we're going to have to do some recording because they're getting ready to do a shelter in place thing here. It was after it happened in San Francisco. Remember when yeah. they shut down San Francisco uh -huh. first? Mm -hmm. That's when in my mind I started saying, OK, this is going to come down to five. So that's when it really well, well, yeah, well, let's pause put a pin there i want to uh, backtrack slightly for people can get a feel um of your ministry and what type of adjustments you're eventually about to make in light of this pandemic uh give us a little background of your journey um into ministry and then ultimately uh your uh, role as the senior pastor and teacher at the bayview church in san diego california so go back to the beginning uh, just summary of, uh, you know, your journey into ministry, but eventually the details of your okay. transition to get you to that. I preached my first sermon on my eighth birthday, mm -hmm. July 7, 1972. And my dad kind of put me in the background after he licensed me. He said the first call was called a preparation, not to the pulpit. So he mm -hmm. let me practice a little bit to get that license and then, you know, put me in the bullpen. It was like, sit, listen, and learn. Wow. Uh, watched him. He started to take me over to my godfather's church in Chicago at the time was Mount Calvary, uh, Donald L. Parson. And I would watch yeah. him sit in the balcony and listen to him preach at night. And he would tell me to, to listen to him and, you know, learn from him, not just listen to what he was preaching, but learn from him. And mm -hmm. then I started, uh, went to high school, played football, went to college, played football, wasn't really thinking about pastor. And that's what I didn't want to do. Two things I said I wasn't going to do, pastor and live in California. So go figure. Uh, <laughs> then, man, my dad had a stroke in 92 and I left football to come handle the tree while he was getting better. <clears throat> that's when things started to turn for me, man. And that's when I saw it differently. Left college after my junior season, started pastoring in Indianapolis, was there for about five years. Came back to Gary to help my dad, was there for about five years. Came out to California, was in Lemon Grove for two years, and then Pastor Winters called me and said, listen, I ain't told nobody this. My wife knows, the chair of our deacons knows, but I wrote myself a letter 30 years ago, said that by now I would know my successor, and I prayed to God and asked him to identify him, and you're it, so get ready to start here. Wow. Served on staff with him as Christian Ed Director and Executive Pastor for a little over five years. And in July, excuse me, June 30th, 2013, he retired. July 1st, 2013, I was in this seat as Senior Pastor and uh, just been grinding it out. How was those five years, um, what was the advantage, would you say, compared to others who just go into something those five years of being on staff at the church with uh, Dr. Winters? 
the legendary Dr. Winters. Man, a lot of deficiencies, I would say, or points for strengthening or weakened areas that he helped me to strengthen, I got to do outside of the spotlight. Mm. So, I mean, and he, from everything from sermon preparation to administration, to sitting in meetings, to sitting in counseling sessions, to getting my finances right, getting my credit score right. He helped mm -hmm. me in so many different things. You know, uh, he literally pushed me to finish school when mm -hmm. I got my undergrad and graduate degrees, uh, then pushed me to buy my first house. I mean, so much stuff. So, so much stuff that I needed to work on and have at least a working knowledge of, I got to develop in, in the shadows. Wow. So people didn't see a lot of the mistakes and all that. And then he, he was, he was, you know, he retired in June and in March of the next year, he was at home with the Lord. But for those last two years, while he was still senior pastor, he kind of let me take the lead on a lot from our mm -hmm. first remodel to so many things. So he could guide me through those stairs steps, oh. but he gave me the reins while he swam between me and the sharks. So wow. there's people who, you know, decisions, differences, you know, anything, when you're the new guy on the block, different means wrong to a lot of people. Yeah. So it's just a lot of people that didn't understand me, didn't know me, didn't trust me yet. So he kind of gave me those reins and he swam. So they, they smelled blood in the water, but he wouldn't let them get close to me. Wow. Uh, so it was a lot of advantages, man. It was tough though, because he wasn't, he wasn't <laughs> an easy, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I felt like a young Jedi. With Obi Wan yeah. and Yoda in one person, so it was, yeah. it, was it was tough. That I, 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 that's what my next question is for those that may not be watching. Uh, those that some that may not some that may be watching may not be familiar uh, with Dr. Winter's ministry. Uh, let them know how uh, large of a giant this is that you're talking about. Um, for those that may not know, he was just man. He was he he was known well through everywhere to this day i still go places and people will say well, you know where are you from what church oh you follow tim winters and they know his name he just made a name for himself he was a teacher uh he was a preacher he was serious about money matters and you know honoring god with your money which is what he is probably most known for uh biblical money management principles uh he just was a guy that people knew, you know, a military guy, Texan, went to the Navy, was a policeman, uh, an educated preacher. So he, he, he was known and number some, some big shoes to fill, literally and figuratively. Um, a national figure as well. What kind of church was Bayview? Bayview was, uh, Bayview was rolling, but it was the opposite of my personality. I, so I like to say Dobbs a little bit country. I'm a little bit rock and roll. So our personalities uh, and our energy in the pulpit were complete polar opposites. Mm -hmm. And so when I came here, I stepped out of the National Baptist kind of mentality and had to become that, you know, everything was about a series, everything was about continuity, everything was about teaching, everything was about being strategic, and that's not what I was used to. And so it, uh, it challenged me for the better. And so it helped me to become multifaceted. I wasn't one dimensional. Uh, I was one dimensional when I came here, but before he retired, I was multidimensional and it has been nothing but a blessing. It was tough while he was here, but like the Bible said, no discipline is good while you're going through it. Right, but, right. Yeah. What were some of the things you could think of even now that stood out, that stood out during that time to make you think, hey man, this this may not gonna work. Have you ever did you ever was you ever there and, and what and uh um, what were were those times just generally speaking and how did you get through those? Uh most of the time because I you know, as far as the tree of life goes in Gary, I was called for life. And so, you know, whether my dad retired or died, that was my right because it was written like that. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I had to purposely and intentionally submit all of who I was to Timothy James Winters, to his hands, believing that God placed me here for a purpose. Got you. So even stuff that, I, that wasn't wrong, mm -hmm. it just wasn't the best I can be. 
I had to intentionally yield. So all, all the time I was like, man, I don't have to deal with this. Man, I don't have to deal with this. I don't have to deal with this, but I have to make the choice rather to go back to what was familiar or stay in the place where I would find God's favor. Wow. And Praise so God. I had to choose favor over familiarity because mm. there's no way the Terry Brooks that I am today, I would have been had I not submitted myself to Timothy James Winters, the same way I submitted myself to Cato Brooks Jr., the same way I submitted myself to Donald L. Parson. If I had not submitted myself to his leadership, knowing that God placed me here for a reason, I wouldn't be who I am today, nor had I gone home, could I be who I am today where I came from. Amen. Talk about that. Talk to a young preacher, young pastor that's uh, wrestling with that. Um, um, try to encourage them there with that information. Just elaborate on that a little bit. On which part? The submitting and how it made you who you are today. And if you wasn't Ooh. willing to do so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It was tough, man, because, you know, people will have you believe in the wrong press. Mm. People like anything fresh and new. I tell people all the time, if you want to sell a product, just put new and improved on it. It can be the same formula. It can be the same anything. How many times they done hit us with a new Coke or a new Pepsi and ain't changed nothing? But, you know, it's... It's just how it is. And so when, when you're new and when you're fresh and when you're different, people in church will make you believe, you know, that you're better than what you are. Or you're further than what you are. And you, you have to listen to people who see the finish line, not just the leg of the race you're in right now. And he mm -hmm. was going on 40 years in, man. So he knew. He knew yeah. exactly uh, what I needed. He knew Bayview. And he knew where Bayview needed to go. Because the, the most lasting statement and I got a lot of statements he said that I can still hear him say today. But one that still haunts me is when he said, if you don't take baby you further than I have, you failed me. And wow. he knew what I was going to have to be to get baby you to go beyond where he had brought it to. So it's July 2013. Uh, you're taking over the ring. How was that transition period? Uh, what are some of the things that uh, you instilled that you put your twist on uh, to take it to, to fulfill what your predecessor, Dr. Winters, has said, taking it to the next level. You, you have, and you have done that. Well, one of the things he did was he didn't stifle my creativity, and he knew I was fearless when it came to change. That's why he gave me so much leeway those last two years of his tenure, because he wanted people to get used to me being a radical change agent. And when that day came, he told me, Anything you want to change is up for grabs except the word. Mm. He says, as long as you keep the level of preaching and teaching where it is, I'll support you anything else you do, even if I don't understand it or support it. As long mm. as it's biblical and as long as it line up, if I could explain it to him, he would say, uh, he called me Tara. All right, Tara. I don't see how that's going to work, but I, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you run with it. <laughs> let you run with it. And, uh, that's what he did, man. He just kind of let me go. So the next day after he retired, he retired on a Sunday, a fifth Sunday in June. That fifth Sunday night, I had to preach for Dr. Meadows at Faithway in their mm -hmm. youth explosion. Uh, mm -hmm. So I drove up there and preached that Sunday night. The next day we came back. I had this thing called Forward. And it was, a, it was Forward was an idea I kind of borrowed from Steve Jobs and Apple. So it mm -hmm. was like the Apple you know, the show, what he did to launch. So we unveiled new logo, new church colors, new website, new app, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was just high rolling. He let me roll with that stuff. And uh, I rolled with the punches and took the bumps. But it, he just told me, you know, there's going to be momentum, but wherever there's momentum, there's going to be detractors. And, mm. you know, to get that momentum, you just got to roll with the punches. And so we rolled with the punches. Some people left. Some people came in, a lot of people left, a lot of people came in. But I had to be comfortable with letting people leave because if they could leave, they probably should leave. Mm -hmm. And I had to be confident in who God was sending that he was sending the right people there. Because I can't pass to everybody, you know, just because they were pastored by Pastor Winters does not mean that I'm gonna be able to lead them. And I had to be comfortable with that. And from him saying that to this day, I'm so comfortable with it. Tell us about the growth of your experience and what would you credit it to besides obviously the sovereign hand of God? <laughs> Don't have a clue. 
I couldn't, I couldn't point to one thing because we experienced a lot of growth at a lot of different times and it had to be God. Cause I know it wasn't me preaching and I know it wasn't, these ideas wasn't great. These sermons, you know, they heard them before they heard better preachers before it was just, that's what it was, man. I just stayed true to who I was and God honored that. That's what I believe it was. I was genuine. Everything I did was genuinely me trying to find my way into the Terry Wayne Brooks that God created me to be. Tell us about the expansion that took place then. Uh, I know you're doing more services, uh, the ministries yeah. you're adding. Well, tell us about that then. So we added a third service on Pastor Winter's birthday. I forgot what year it was, but it was a Resurrection Sunday. And I added this third service uh, because I knew, he and I talked about it because we know, you know, transition growth. Again, it's new, it's fresh. People are going to come. I'm younger, so I'm going to attract a younger crowd. And San Diego is a young military, young college, young family town. So I'm going to attract people like that. Uh, had some little rough edges come growing up in Gary, Indiana. So I got a little, little hood and a little holy. You know how it is. So I was going <laughs> to attract another crowd. You know, you know, I just, the people you identify with, people are drawn to what they see that they can identify with. So I knew it was going to happen like that. So we added that third service, which a lot of people wanted to crucify me for at first because even though our numbers grew, the attendance at each service kind of went down because there was a third option. But, you know, that grew. Uh, eventually, we made outreach magazines, uh, fastest growing churches, which I don't report to anymore. Uh, Why is that? Because I, didn't, I don't want that to become the focus of making that list. Mm. I don't want us to, we could, we could, we could, creativity that's not rooted in theology becomes gimmicks. Darius mm -hmm. Daniels, I think, told me that. And what I didn't want to do is gimmick my way into growth because then you got to gimmick your way to keep them. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want that to become the focal point. So uh, that was a great experience, but I didn't want that pressure to be a part of ministry. Uh, and so we, and we continued to grow. And then I, I saw what we were doing as churches. You know, everybody's church was doing food giveaways, clothes giveaways. But what I wanted to do was give people not just that stuff. Dignity is big to me because I've always come. You come from the Midwest, man. You know how it is where mm -hmm. they'll give us things, but they don't give it to us in a way that allows us to maintain our dignity. Mm -hmm. We got to stand outside in lines. We have to look like uh, it's always a picture of us getting handouts instead of hand, a hand up. Mm -hmm. So I want to do everything differently. So that's where the boutique came from and the grocery store came from. And, the, you know, the, 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 we call it the tell winners. Us about the, tell us about the boutique. Tell us about the grocery store. store tell us about the winners program. Man, I wanted to do our food giveaway in a place that would give people the passion to pull themselves up so they would never settle for less. So we built a grocery store and I wanted it to look better than any grocery store in our area. And I wanted them to have personal shoppers and the same thing with the boutique. I wanted them to have personal shoppers and I wanted it to be free on a case by case basis. So it's for those who are in need, not those who are greedy. So you do have to qualify to be served there, but you are served in excellence. The winner's circle is for you know, parents who have children on the autism spectrum. Uh, so they can worship and not have to worry about if their children are in capable hands. We've hired professionals to be in there so they can worship together. I had couples I didn't even know was married because I didn't realize they had children who were autistic and they couldn't come to church at the same time until we had a special service for it. You know, we did the counseling center because I can't, I'm not, I'm not called to be a counselor, man. I'm not good at it. I'm just mm -hmm. not good at it. I don't always have the patience. I don't always have the sympathy or the empathy. And I know that. So rather than wreck people's lives, there are people who are called and qualified to do it. So we built that counseling center so that we can service people's needs. We have that mental health support group. So we, you know, groups, I should say, to support those who are having those struggles because Christians have those struggles too. And so we just started providing everything. You can get preaching at any church. You can get worship at any church. But there are some things that we were missing as a people in our church community that I believe we needed to provide. And I wanted to do it. There was no model for me to do it in our community. So, you know, I had to take the hits for doing it. And we took hits for it. And it's, you know, it looks great now. But I, I got wounds from that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So you got 
packed out services, you got progressive ministry, you, you're, you're meeting people with their holistically, I'm helping them with their parental skills, their marriage, counseling, um, all this is taking back place. And then comes COVID-19, midst of your March gladness, anniversary, Easter coming soon. How are you adjusting? How have you adjusted? Uh, let me say this. I look like a superstar because Bayview is full of off the chain people. It's not hard to lead Bayview. It's not, it's just not hard to lead Bayview because there's a different spirit in Bayview when it comes to responding to leadership. Mm. Uh, so they give me all this room to be me. Uh, they give me room to make mistakes. I can come back and say that didn't work. Here's what we're going to do. So we want to do that again. Here's what we learned. Here's what we're going to do. And I don't have to go to the firing squad or the cross when that happens. Uh, mm. So that's, that's the first thing. So the first thing I did was say, okay, we've got a shelter in place. How do we keep delivering what they are accustomed to? So that's why we do Sunday the way we do, which we don't do on Sunday. Uh, all of our lives that go out, none of them are actually live. Sammy Blackman is our tech director. Uh, I don't know what he does to make it look like that, but he does it and he does it well. Uh, Dwayne Woods. Tell us backtrack, tell us how do you do your services and um, how you've been doing what what's those components there? Man, we come in and uh, we we record. If you see a dancer, if you see somebody playing the sax, they're recorded in singular sessions and then those videos are edited. Um, the Bayview worship, you may be <clears throat> seeing a song that I was actually in the room when they sang, or you may not be. Mm -hmm. On some of our Wednesday on Hope and Hymns, you know, we've had Anita Wilson on the front. We've had Donald Lawrence in there. Clearly, they're not here at that time, but he, mm -hmm. he pulls from files he's already had. He's able to mesh them so they, it's, it's so much continuity, you can't really tell. As a matter of fact, dude, I got roasted online by this lady who was saying mm -hmm. I, I represented the height of irresponsibility because I was right. still having services. Right. And while she was saying that, I'm like, ma'am, I'm at home with you while you watching the stream. And she couldn't believe that we weren't in church on the Wednesday night before resurrection because I was in the moment and kept saying this evening and stuff like that. I mean, tore me to shreds. I was like, that's what I get for being creative. So, mm -hmm. but you know, yeah, so I mean, I don't know how Sammy does that stuff, man, but we do it, record them out, uh, and they're, they're ready to go. But, you know, I have to be responsible. But at the same time, I have to deliver what they've used, used to see. That's why I don't do the living room. That's why I'm not sitting anywhere, because they're used to seeing me behind that desk on that stage. And that's what they're accustomed to. That's our continuity. That's our safe place. That's, our, that, that's what it is. So that's what I'm getting. And what about ooh, your Dwayne Woods. I don't know how he goes to that level and gets baby worship to sing to that level when the room is empty. I don't know how Chris Daniels, who is our MD, gets Noah and Ron and Bird and Marcus to play at that level when the room is empty. But probably because I empower them, I don't get in their business. I don't know what they do. I, 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 I pastor intensely, intentionally, and intimately, my team of pastors, uh, my executive team, and they mm -hmm. pastor everything they lead. And so I'm, I'm hands on with them, and man, they make it work. And so they enable me to, be, I couldn't do that by myself. Mm -hmm. They have to, they set the tone for me to be able to preach like it's a room full of people, because it's there when I get up. And man, without them, it, it wouldn't work. But that man, the people, I feel like, I don't feel like Michael Jordan or Kobe or LeBron, I feel like, you know, Steve Kerr, and I'm just on their coattails. Right. Because they are so good at what they do from tech to worship to music to uh, dancers. Everybody just steps in and they don't miss a beat. That's how I know it's true. That's how I know it's pure because they don't miss a beat. The spirit in the sanctuary when we're doing them recordings, it feels like Sunday, even though it's not. And it's just ridiculous, what about, man. What about your preaching? Uh, it's easy to preach after them, and then our worship team. No, no, no. How are you doing it? But how, how, how are you, how are you doing your sermons? Are you pre, pre, 
pre-recording those on a Wednesday, Thursday, or something like that? Yes. Any day of the week that we got to open it, we record. I got you. And what have you been preaching? What have you felt been felt led to preach during this time? The first series I did was uh, crisis communication. And so mm-hmm. what I wanted to communicate in the crisis. Um, this series now is called Rock Solid. And it's just building a life that can stay in life storm so God can bless you to bless others. So I'm preaching stuff to help us stay engaged while reminding us what the world needs to see from us and what the world is going to need from us. Because the answer is still not in the White House. It's in God's house. And we have Mm -hmm. to. Rick Warren told me this. You don't have to sell your ministry. If you make yourself a solution, people will seek you out. And so we've tried to become what people need in this time. And so it's just, so you, yeah. Yeah. No, no, go ahead, finish. No, no, you go, go ahead. ahead. All right. Uh, you know Rick Warren? Yeah. Tell us about that relationship. I, I met Rick Warren in the early 90s. My dad, he and my dad did uh, conferences together for Adrian Rogers. My dad was uh-huh. in the Southern Baptist way back then at Bellevue which now uh, Jason Turner and in Memphis, they have that building, but it used to be the old Bellevue with Adrian Rogers. And uh, he told me about him years ago, man. So when I started pastoring in 1993, I was using Rick's class system then. So mm-hmm. I've been a student of the purpose driven church model uh, for years, man. Uh, and when I came back, when I came out here to pastor, uh, my brother, my guy, uh, his Bishop A.B. Vines at New Seasons here. So I want to pay for you to go to the Purpose Driven Church Conference for me. This was like 05, 06. Mm-hmm. And we were walking around and Rick walked up and grabbed me and started singing Ebony and Ivory and, you know, started talking and told me I looked familiar. And I told him who I was. And at that moment, he's like, I need you to stay connected to me. And from that moment on, I've been connected to him and Saddleback in some shape, form, or fashion. But lately, here lately, since I've been senior pastor, he's almost, he's let me into the back of the house to, you know, I I was, at one time I was going to staff meetings at Saddleback, Mm -hmm. uh, sitting there asking the most questions, probably the dumbest questions, the most redundant questions, because I needed to pick his brain. I needed to know why he was doing stuff the way he did it, because, I mean, he you can't deny he's successful at what he does. And mm-hmm. so I wanted to know why he chose to do some of the things that had success. So, mm-hmm. you know, up close and from afar, I've been mentored by he and Saddleback. So it's just been, it's a blessing. It's, a, it's, it's overwhelming at times. But yeah, yeah, I get to go back and be like, hey, dude, I heard you say this, but why? And when he answered we'll that question, back. back with another one, why? So. We'll pick back up on that. I was using that question as a lead in, as you know, I already know you uh, know where you're going. <laughs> um, crisis communication. What were some of the things uh, that you felt need to be communicated to your congregation during this crisis? It was really don't panic, you know, okay. uh, stay calm. Mm-hmm. The same God you trusted before the pandemic knew this was coming and was mm-hmm. prepared. You know, so that's that's what that was. It was more of, you know, it was a making it on broken pieces sermon. It was, uh, you know, just staying calm in a crisis, learning how to pray in a crisis, like, you know, from Daniel. So just here's how we should behave, looking at people who we look up to from the word. Here's how they behaved in the crisis. Here's how we should behave in a crisis. So it was kind of setting the precedent. I don't know how long this is going to last, but however long it's going to last, this is the person that God needs to be able to use doing this. Wow. What, uh, how have you ministered to your seniors during this time? We, uh, the first thing we did, and I, and I pulled my E-team in, it was like, hey, everybody's going to become, you know, telemarketers. And so <laughs> everybody got phone lists, and the executive team, the pastoral staff, we made the first initial calls to every person in the church. And we talked to the seniors, making sure they had what they needed, if they needed groceries. If they needed, I knew because our seniors, that's why we, I used to have a 645 service and the seniors would be sitting in there at 605. Mm-hmm. So I knew they were like, so how we go have church? We made sure that they could connect online every way they wanted to and they knew how to do it so that I could deliver what it was they were 
you know, accustomed to seeing and what they were looking for. That's why I hope hymns came out because I know our older generation loves those hymns. When the studio, I started talking, Dwayne started singing, and now, you know, we're doing that on Wednesday. So I just made sure they were okay. Mm -hmm. And I asked them what they wanted to hear. And they were saying, well, can we do some of those hymns on Sunday? And I said, I'm not going to go to a hymn based on Sunday, but here's what I will do. And so uh, we check on them. They check on each other. We have some of the most progressive seniors, man. You'd be shocked. <laughs> there, there, there's one lady in our church who, after I'm done preaching, I go straight to her page because she has done a synopsis of my sermon. And she wow. comes to the first service. So I go read that to make sure I'm on point <laughs> before I go back and preach the second and third service, man. Right. But we got some, 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 our seniors are. They rock for real. And are you broadcasting one service and doing a replay or are you just broadcasting and they can watch the replay? Uh, we're, we're doing one service and it, the same service plays three times on Sunday. Got you. And then it's a different one on Wednesday. How are you ministering to your young people and families during this time? So uh, Lisa Daniels, who's married to our MD, Chris Daniels, is over our student ministries. And she has them on a little schedule. They they have their own, the, the way they had them set up, they were doing like what we call small groups is impact groups. Impact are our values and they all stand for something. So they are doing their impact groups. They're doing their videos and they're doing it on a Friday evening and she has them tied in and tuned in. It grew so much that they couldn't be on the same call. They had to break off in the calls. And I've watched my youngest son running around the house. I'm like, what are you doing? It was like, they got us doing a scavenger hunt. I'm about to throw them out the house and run them down the stairs, but he's in this group. <laughs> And so they're engaged. Uh, initially, when we went to the shelter in place and we could still gather, we would have some of the teens here every day because teens run our tech ministry. Uh, so the pictures, the graphics, the cameras, all that was run by teens. So they were like here doing school work and working during the day. And so wow. she has them engaged and going and connected. And uh, she's done an amazing job. Uh, she checks in with me, tell me what's going on who they had, and I mind my business because I try to give them, another thing Rick said, when you give the ministry to the people, they give the leadership back to you. So I've been leading and letting them do the ministry. How do, how do, what do you feel like has been the biggest struggle for you during this time? I like being around people. Mm. So the biggest struggle is not being able to see people. Yeah. Uh, that's probably, probably it. Uh, and what about for the church? What are the things that you are um, have impacted you are um, challenging? I should say, maybe not a struggle, but that has been the biggest challenge from a church standpoint. Staying creative, coming up with different ideas. One challenge we have now is getting connected. I was just talking to uh, our pastor of membership, Quasi Swan. We've had, since the first Sunday in March, over 100 people unite with Bayview. And since mm -hmm. we've been in the shelter in place around 70 something. So now we're trying to figure out a way to engage everybody. As soon as they launched a shelter in place, we launched a new website and an uh, internet campus. This was stuff I had been working on. So I was being chess minded in the checkers mode. But as soon as mm -hmm. that happened and we start hearing about it, we went to, you know, launch that. And uh, so now we've been trying to figure out how to deal with our new norm. Because here's my argument, G. Hebrews 10 and 25 says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And mm -hmm. you've heard that before. I think I owe people an apology because I've been talking as, that, as if that meant to come to the sanctuary. But now, thinking about it, I'm not too sure if they had sanctuaries when the writer of Hebrews wrote it. Hmm. And so now, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, we're assembling now, and we're hundreds of miles from each other. Right. People are going to assemble. They assemble now. We got people in Pakistan and Alaska who united with Bayview, and they assemble every Sunday in a common place. So now I've got to learn how to manage the assembly when it doesn't look like what I'm accustomed to. Mm. And that's still my responsibility. And it's still my burden and God still holds me responsible. So I have to come, I have to become creative enough and wise enough not to be so in love with the church I grew up with and pastor the church that God has given me now. Amen. 
Uh, explain to us what an internet campus is, where the idea birthed from, and how you've launched it. Uh, I don't know what an internet church campus is. We're still building ours. But what it is, is a place where I can deliver as much as people would get corporately being physically present. I have to find a way to get that to those people who can't make it here to be a part of our local corporate assemblies. I have to make sure that I can do the same for them because truth be told is I don't physically touch every member of Bayview. It's too many of us. I couldn't do it, but I have people that connect with them. So I have to connect them in such a way because if they're going to be under my leadership, I don't care if they're in Pakistan. It's still my responsibility to give him as much attention as I would somebody who sits on the first row when I'm in the sanctuary every Sunday or whatever. So, so we're still rolling that out. Okay. So when you said you launched, what was the term you used? You said you launched the... We launched a campus. So now uh, that, that's, that's, an, that's an option to be okay. a member of the Bayview Church if you don't live in this area. And okay. what we've done, and Erica Wise, you met her before, Erica. Oh, yeah. uh, genius, yes. She designed so much stuff uh, mm -hmm. to where there's a campus where they have, they have a different experience. So they have an experience that people who come here won't have. When they watch, they'll have a welcome video. They'll see me live like I'm talking to you and be able to chat with me before service. They'll have an internet campus. They'll have internet hosts who will interview people that will talk to them. Uh, and it's the young people doing it. They came up with all kind of trivia contests and all kind of stuff to engage them before service. Keep them after service. They'll have their own virtual small groups that only they can, you know, uh, have access to. They'll go through our, you know, our 101, 201, 301, and 401 differently than anybody else will. They'll be responsible for having, you know, personal peace and local peace and corporate peace where they are. They, they have, the church gathers on Sunday, but then we go to our different mission state stations Monday through Saturday. So now they have to be Bayview wherever they are. And whatever we're doing here, we have to make sure they're trained, edified, and equipped to be Bayview where they are. So that's what that internet campus is going to do. Wow. Oh, I see what you're saying now. And um, what made you think through that? What, what birthed that ideal in you? Because could nobody get to church? And then I started to think about if I can minister to people locally who can't get to church, then surely we can do it worldwide. Yeah, we've been trying to contemplate that same thing. You're absolutely right. Um, tell us about uh, what you're thinking about as far as preaching forward thinking, how you're processing uh, the return back to church, um, if at all, uh, how, how you plan to roll that out and communicate that to people. So first you're preaching, uh, let's start with that and then uh, administratively uh, going phasing out from this new normal back to which will never be back to what it was before but you know to that level of where that uh so right now preaching i'm just i really didn't change anything one of the things that pastor winters made me think differently was how i was preaching because i grew up where you didn't a lot of people didn't do a lot of series it was right. just you came in, you had your one-off, you had your intro, your conclusion, and you shut it down, opened the doors of the church and went home. So now, uh, and this has really, what it has done is I've moved into this mode, so I really am not, I used to do a lot of revivals and travel, I suck at that now, because that's just not the kind of preacher I am, because my sermons are building blocks. And if mm -hmm. it's like, if you take a sermon in the series out of context, you miss the rest of the context. Right. So. <laughs> Uh, that's all I'm, that's all I'm going to do is continue that style of preaching and continue to preach the same way. There's no need for me to panic in what I'm going through uh, because people don't need, okay, we did our don't panic sermons. Y'all got that down. Let's continue to grow while we have this opportunity. So that's the same way I'm going to do now. And we just had a meeting uh, about how we would come back and it's going to be, you know, we're going to have to, the burden is going to be on us because we're still going to practice social distancing. I don't care what they say. Yeah. I'm not running back into a herd, a room full of people. We still sit in, you know, every other seat, <laughs> every other row. So, man, we might be in a weekend doing 10 services so that we can keep people socially distanced, but also offer uh, a safe environment. We're still going to have to do a lot of stuff. So we're we working on that now, man. And I, you give me till Friday, I got a better answer for you. But okay. 
Yeah, we're gonna put out something about that now in anticipation uh, because I'm past the reactionary point of leading through this pandemic and now yes, I'm playing chess. Yes, sir. So every move is strategic. Uh, strategic on how I can keep people plugged in now, but also how to you know, go back into whatever the new norm is going to be while letting people know I want you to come back for corporate worship, but I care about your health. I care about your anxiety. I care about your stress. And we're going to take every precaution. Should you choose to come in this soon, how we'll keep you safe while you're in the sanctuary. Let, let me ask you about, uh, you, you hit everything. I want to add one other element to what you talked about, the fiscal element. Um, there as how have, without any details, how have your given been and how have you been thinking through uh, the assistance of people uh, with 26 million people filing for unemployment, even if they start all working tomorrow, you gotta, you're gotta you adjusting and catching up and most of them was already catching up uh, uh, before, probably not as many as Bayview because you have such a strong financial literacy um, um, program instilled into you. Um, how are you processing that and how's your experience been in that thus far? Well, man, listen, we have that financial literacy uh, ministry, but everybody don't take advantage of it. Right. You know, most people don't want to go through there until they want to buy a house and find mm -hmm. out their credit score is not where it is. Then they won't help. <laughs> they want to do intervention, not prevention. But the one thing I didn't do was I didn't say a lot about giving because I knew people were going to panic. And when they panic, they start thinking about how I'm going to make it. So they, they hold on. And I didn't want to at that time say, I need y'all to give, 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 give. When people ask how to give, we told them. When people ask for envelopes, we send it to them. Uh, but I didn't say a lot. So at first, it went to a screeching halt. But as we are transitioning and people are seeing what it's not, it's, it's steadily increased. Right before, actually, actually during March Gladness, we were giving toward upgrading technology. And people were looking at me like, we got enough technology. We don't need no more. Bam, this pandemic hits. So everything I said started to make sense. Mm -hmm. So the very thing I was telling you we needed to do and have, now you see why it was so important. So I did have people who would leave notes and say, I hope this helps with this. I hope this helps with this. And now they see why technology is so important because now technology is all they have. When you're in the sanctuary, you're really not concerned about the person at work or in their living room or on the ship or on the college campus who is streaming because you can get to the sanctuary. When you can't get to the sanctuary, you start to worry about stuff you didn't worry about before. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now, you know, it's, it's, it's coming back slowly but surely. Uh, and I thank God for it. People at Bayview are just generous and they were like that before me. That's, that's Pastor Winter's footprint or fingerprint. He was the one that really taught and instilled that, and I just continued it. And then uh, with all the remodeling stuff we're doing, people see what we're doing with what they contribute to the church. So they don't have a problem giving to vision that they can eventually see. <clears throat> and so people see that. And then uh, as far as assisting people, um, of course, the, the boutique, uh, the, the grocery store, our mental health support, our counseling services is one way, but that's, that, that's probably the extent of how we've been helping people because there are too many people for us to try to sow into financially if we sold into everybody. Right. We have some ideas about what we can do. Uh, there are some people that want to partner. So it, it depends on how, I don't know if we coming off this May 1st, you know, there's some places that have gone to June I don't know if we do, but there are some options to, you know, do meals and have them prepared here in the kitchen. If we, you know, partner with services to help feed people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. The good thing is, you know, people's mortgages are being deferred. You can't, pe you know, so the ge government is helping out a lot, which they should because they shut everybody down. Right. But, uh, you know, we're just trying to figure out how we can be of the best service to people. Uh, that's about it. Yeah, it's still a, it's still a, trying to see what pieces fit. Definitely. Um, you talked about not changing your preaching style and things of that nature, but as far as content, um, where are you leaning? Is there somewhere you're leaning as far as you think the church needs to hear a certain series, a certain messages, 
uh, you think the church needs to hear um, in preparation, uh, not just getting through this pandemic, but transitioning out of it? I think I did it. I think crisis communication was what they needed to hear. It was okay. you know, how to how to how to pray, how to survive, how to make it. I think I got them there, and from the responses, people were getting it. Now, uh, just like Sunday, uh, that that new series, Rock Solid. The first one was about building the foundation of a life that God can bless. Here's how you have that foundation. Sunday was watch your mouth. It talked about how we talk to each other because I'm sure being around people more than you used to being around people. Yes, sir. You start when words turn into swords. And so it was just how you deal with people with your words, how you speak truthfully, how you build people up, how you affirm people. So just a review of the basic Christian characteristics that we really didn't need in our homes as much as we do now. Hmm. And so yeah. that's all I'm going to do. Just simple, you know, nothing deep where they got to have a degree to understand uh but just here's something you can take and at the end of every point in my sermon i give them homework find somebody that you can intentionally be nice to find somebody you can intentionally value find somebody you can intentionally speak the truth to and love so give yeah. them something to do engaging so your sermon becomes marching instructions instead of a lesson a lecture lesson yeah we're in the process of doing that this week uh we're 40 days with jesus post easter and this week is a uh, service but all the service is listening. So mm -hmm. this week, they're just to call a friend, call a former associate, and listen to them. Um, yeah. not, not, not do, so those type of things. So absolutely good to hear that. That helps confirm what we're doing. Um, of of very various things that we've already talked about that we're trying to um, duplicate those similar things. Uh, tell us about the books you've been reading, the things you've been meditating on as far as scripture, just for personal development and just uh, in any, any way that you're reading or, uh, or going through those things? friend I met a while ago named Mark Miller writes a lot of good leadership books. And uh, mm -hmm. right now we're reading his book called Chess Not Checkers. It's about being strategic leaders and not reactionary leaders. So I'm taking the staff through that. He's got a field guide uh, that you can you know study through it. He has several books and we're going to read several of those. Uh, I've read and reread my little brother's book, Keon. Keon Henderson wrote a book called The Shift. Uh, I've been reading that uh, just for some of the principles that he he's had. I've, I've been going back reading different books that I've read to refresh myself with. You know how you read a book and you be like, ooh, I'm going to do something on that, and you never get back to it? Yeah. So now I've been going back through those books from that stack because this is the time I have to go through it to digest it, if God spoke to me then, see if I can recall God's voice so, you know, I can kind of hear what, what God was saying then. So that's, that's, that's pretty much where I am. Well, some of the first things you want to do on the other side of this uh, pandemic, um, personally, ministry-wise? Uh, some of the things I want to do personally is I really, really, really got to get back in the gym. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was working with a boxing trainer, man, so I was getting these hands right because, you know, my son's getting big. And just yeah. in case, I, but, you know, I got to back him up off me. Uh, but I'm definitely missing going to the gym. Uh, another thing I want to do is I want to do something, and we've got some ideas we could talk about offline, for seniors, high school seniors in yeah. our area who missed out on so much. I got a whole list of things we want to do for them. Uh, and then again, I, I just want to start expanding our reach and getting people to understand that one thing this pandemic has forced us to do, and we say it's so cliche, is come outside of the four walls of our sanctuary. Our reach is bigger than that. And we've got to, we've got to be cool with reaching that. You yeah. know, and this is, you know, we have a president in this country who a lot of people will never meet, yet he is tasked to lead us all. Mm -hmm. And we'll never get to the White House and sit in those rooms, but every decision that affects us comes out of that room. And so mm -hmm. the church has to figure out we have the same kind of reach. We, everybody doesn't have to sit in our sanctuary for us to lead them in the way they should go. And we've got to get out of our mind that everybody got to come to the sanctuary and that Hebrews 10 and, 10 and 25 was referring to a sanctuary when we're not for certain they even had sanctuaries then. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just, you know, that's it, man. I just want to get us 
out of that, that mindset. That's my mode right there. That we don't fall back into the same place we were. We got to come out this other side better. Oh, man. Praise God for you, brother. Uh, I want you to pray for us. Um, but before we get out of here, um, before we went live, uh, before we begin recording this to go on YouTube, uh, there was a conversation uh, that was taking place um, as your Zoom came through. Uh, with my there was some blasphemy going on on your end. Um, uh, 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 hold on for a second. You, you'll get your chance. Uh, I would like to set this table. Uh, there, the uh, ESPN in the world's infatuation with a guy named Michael Jordan has it's been Aaron. airing the uh, Michael Jordan um, has been uh, airing these uh, documentaries. Uh, I have to live through this uh, for three more weeks of this fabricated, uh, slanted historical perspective on on this this young man, uh, uh, um, uh, Michael Jordan. As I was getting out some rants because as you know the Detroit Pistons Detroit where I'm from uh beat the, the Bulls uh uh mentally uh physically you might want to yeah get your hands clean for I'm this. watching my hands of this I'm like yeah. <laughs> I'm watching my hands physically mo emotionally uh uh psychology uh from a mental standpoint uh just really ran through them my team got a little older <clears throat> Um, and so they, they had an opportunity to finally beat them. And uh, last night, uh, while this was being aired, um, the, the, the Michael Jordan guy, he was, he's still upset about somebody not shaking his hand or something. Um, and I, I really find him disgraceful. I find him coming off as a colossal jerk. Um, and you were you were disagreeing with that, and I, I wanted to be fair and just give you the opportunity. Maybe you wanted to say something about about that um, in relationship to that. Yeah. So yeah, his airness was speaking about uh, those enemies that became the footstool to his legacy. Uh, the Detroit Pistons are mostly responsible for the greatness that is Michael Jordan. Talk, now. Talk preacher. Because of their dominance. Yes, sir. And uh, they forced him to not be a one-dimensional player. Come on in the room, brother. However, every year when they would beat him as a sign of respect, he would yeah. congratulate them and wish them well in the next stage because in the Eastern Conference Finals, it's no longer, you know, C1 against C2. It's Eastern Conference versus Western Conference. So he would wish those people, you know, good luck. And they accepted that until the tables turned. Uh, when the tables turned and it was no longer game seven and they went out on a broom, they wouldn't give him the, the same respect. And the, the upsetting part is Isaiah Thomas, who was visibly the leader of the Detroit Pistons at that time, in this moment of defeat, yielded his leadership to Bill Lambeer, who still ain't leading nobody, which was disappointing. Uh, however, I do understand that that was the custom back then. And they did it to the Bulls because the Celtics did it to them. Right, right. But mama taught us two wrongs don't make a right. Mm. But needless to say, however many years, those three years, and Detroit didn't get three championships out of those three years, but after their back-to-back, -back, Isaiah got two rings. They got two. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, Michael went on to get six. So okay. uh, he, he probably – he should have just said to them what you meant for evil. Mm. God turned it around and meant it for my good. Because wow. that's the only reason the Pistons are mentioned is because mm. they were a stepping stone. So mm. really, he shouldn't let their irrelevance irritate him at this point. My God, my God. That was it? Because as a, learning these interview skills, one thing I'm learning is you don't interrupt. Um, <laughs> Uh, the person you interview while they're speaking. And I, I really held back some things. No, no, go ahead. No, no, you have one more thing. So. No, man, but for real, though, I think... Yeah. I don't think it was a big deal. I right. think that maybe 
Michael thought they were better friends than they were. They weren't but, friends. They never were. Yeah, but I don't know how he would think that. You know, after the freeze out in the All Star game, I don't know how he would think that. So after what he said in the interview the day before. Yeah, the the lessons I learned is, you know, watch your expectations, and it'll you know help you avoid some disappointments. Come on in the room. So that's that's what I learned. Well, well and you got to go, and I know you're really gonna rush and say you got to go now. Um, but I do want to say a couple things about uh, some of the things that you said. Come on. I, I can't do the whole thing. I can't Come on, do the talk whole at thing. Me. Talk at me. Talk <laughs> okay. at me. I, 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 I just want to say, because you, 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 you was going good. You know, we taught the Bulls how to win. The Bulls would never won if it wasn't for us. But you said, however, uh, when Jordan lost, uh, because he was still learning the toughness, internal toughness that needed, so when the team beat him, he want to go out and hug everybody. Nice way to beat us. Now you represent the East. And that was part of their softness. And so we are teaching them the eternal fortitude that you got to have that if a team beats you, because this is war, figuratively speaking, you understand. It's a game. We don't, we don't do all this hugging and, and, uh, and, and congratulations and stuff. That's not, that's how, that's not how, that's not how gangsters move on this level, okay? Uh, well, and so, war is between enemies, though, bro, not between friends. They never were friends. They never were friends. But you just said they were friends. No, no, I said they never were friends. I said they never okay. were. Okay. Jordan said some mean stuff before then. He was always complaining before then. Now, if he wanted to be soft and hug everybody afterwards, that, that's up to him. The Bible says that the gentleness be made known. Yeah, that's the Bible. But we're talking about NBA now. Uh, uh, <laughs> Lil G. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait, so that's not how we move. That's not, we trying to teach you. Hey, bro, when you get beat, you ain't all up there. Good game. We but trying to show you Magic after Magic them beat him. Huh? He kissed Magic after Magic them beat him. That was before the game. And they was elbowing each other 30 seconds later. So they should cancel after, after the series. I don't believe they did. They Matter did. of fact, the first year the, the Pistons lost, Isaiah tells this amazing story. He says him and Lamb Bears in a shocker in, in, a, in a shower crying. Then out of nowhere, the first year they beat like which the year they really beat the Lakers, but they got cheated in game seven with that final fall against Kareem. Nobody talks about that. We really should be going for a four peak. And we ain't going to talk about the years the Celtics treated, cheated before that. But they said they go into the Lakers locker room while they celebrated, take their champagne and said, these for the real champions and walk out. <laughs> like, so it, 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 that's how it went. Magic and, and Zeke stopped hanging after that. They used to hang all summer. When they start rival, they stopped hanging out that. Jordan is a sore winner. He, he's somebody he's a that sore like a sore winner. It's he's somebody that's a loser. It's sometimes it's actually a little worse because you like uh, a winner should have some class about itself. He's, he's, but when he he's does this, it looks better because he got no. rings all around here. Yeah, I got I got what you were going with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, 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 I just never seen nobody get all these advantages in life. He's gotten passes on all of his social justice inadequacies. His, everything he's done that's if he did it today in this internet age, uh, he'll be vilified. Uh, he didn't talk to media people that would try to critique him honestly, and he still whines about just little. He's such a little big man. I, I would expect more from him, uh, but at the same time, I don't expect more from him because that's been his mo. But uh, I respect you. I thank you uh, uh, for coming on, and we, we're gonna finish this conversation another time where we can talk a little bit more freely uh, uh, than uh, this Facebook live. The, don't bring no broom. Bring my groom, but we, from the same broom we, that y'all got sweat with. Yeah, yeah. Well, after beating somebody for three years, they they need to try to sweep us because you know three years. Because I think game seven of uh, Scotty Pippen had a headache or something that day. Yeah, I don't know what was going headache. on with Scotty. Oh yeah, because they didn't have Tylenol back then. Oh, so, so uh, since then, I don't even think Jordan. I, that's probably why he allergic to game seven. Yeah, yeah, he, he probably learned after we beat him in that game seven. No, yeah, you know, in the championship. Yeah, I, I got where you're going with this stuff. I see where you're going. Um, prayers out of here, prayers out of here, bro, man. Appreciate you, man. 
I'm going to pray for everybody except the Detroit Pistons from 1991. Father, forgive them. <laughs> God, thank you for this day and for this time and for my brother. Thank you for his heart, his ministry, his life. Thank you for his uh, willingness to be out on the forefront to bring these conversations to the forefront so that we can speak in common, everyday conversation about what we face as pastors, as brothers, as uh, the people of God going through a unprecedented time with this pandemic. God, I pray that those who view this will be encouraged. I pray that they'll be enlightened. I pray that they'll smile. I pray that they'll laugh. I pray that they'll find inspiration. I, I pray that they'll hear your voice speaking. Even in this conversation with myself and George, God, I pray is your voice that they hear uh, when we're laughing and engaging as brothers and, and they're uh, spectating. I pray that it's a uh, your presence they're feeling and i pray god it's your will they get off this call wanting to do i pray god that we'll be a better church than we have been i pray that we'll reach further than we have i pray that we'll go beyond where we've gone i pray that our expectations will be raised i pray god that our visibility will be better and in all that said i pray that the world gets a better picture of you i pray that we keep no glory for ourselves I pray, God, that not only would you bless myself and my brother and our respective churches, but for every pastor and every church around the world, God, I pray that you would just hold them mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Yes. I pray for those who are grieving during this time, grieving the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or the loss of an income stream, the loss of a residence or whatever it may be, God. I pray for those who need healing right now, not just because of the virus, but whatever may be going on in their body, God, I know you can heal if you, if you choose to. I pray that you'd heal emotionally and mentally and spiritually. I pray that you uh, would put a, a hold on anxiety and depression, thoughts of suicide and addiction. I pray that you would uh, come against domestic violence, and sexual abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse. I pray that you come against anything, any habit or any uh, hurt or any hang up that would separate us from your glory at this time. I pray God that uh, this world begins to see that you're still in control. I pray for our leaders worldwide that they would open their hearts, their minds and their ears to you. And remember that the answer comes from you, not from them. Mm. I pray God that you would just be the God you promised to be, the God of all comfort in these times because the fact of the matter is we trust you for everything and we doubt you for nothing. And we pray this prayer in expectation, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, appreciate so, it again. Uh, we 